That's my disclosures, it will not influence any part of my presentation. Patients with peripheral vascular disease and CLI face a gloomy future. CLI bears a dismal prognosis with mortality estimates of 30% for the first year, and if left untreated, a five-year mortality rate is up to 70%. The whole clinical dilemma is to prevent such a disastrous result. Perfection in vascular surgical techniques with enhancement in endovascular maneuvers has changed CLI management. In light of advancements over the past 10 years, historical studies, chronological task classifications and results no longer apply to contemporary CLI management protocol. A forceful strategy in CLI management is vindicated on health economic grounds as long as technical and clinical outcomes are over 75%. However, literature appraisal revealed that only 19% of patients have an uncomplicated inframguinal reconstruction. Quality of time spent without symptom of disease or its toxicity is the ultimate contrivance engaging in intervention. There are bundles of variables in old population groups that the traditional health related to quality of life cannot chronicle, nor can they perceive the transformations which individual patients may encounter. Our primary aim is to equate effectiveness of SIA with BS in sustained clinical improvement and amputation-free survival. Secondary endpoints are binary restenosis rate, freedom from target lesion revascularization, risk of major clinical adverse events, quality of time spent without symptom of disease or toxicity of treatment, and cost effectiveness. From 2002 to 2007, 1,076 patients were referred with peripheral vascular disease. Clinical procedure, imaging and follow-up data are routinely entered and prospectively maintained in our VASCU-based system. Using this system, we performed a prospective observational parallel group comparison of 334 primary procedures, SIA-206, BS-128, in 309 CLI patients, NSIA-190, NBS-119, with TAS-C and D lesions. 55% were females in SIA group versus 35% in BS. All patients in critical limb ischemia, Rutherford category 4 to 6, with TAS-C and D lesions. And all lesions were de novo rather than recurrent. There was no significant difference between groups regarding lesion length, inflow or runoff. All preoperative and follow-up imaging was done by colour duplex ultrasound. It was the sole imaging modality in 90% of patients. The remaining 10% had magnetic resonance imaging due to calcification hampering visualisation of the tibial vessels. We used six French introducer sheets to remove 0.035 inch curved straight or bullia tipped guide wires with Pierre and Van Andel catheters were used for sub-intimal dissection. In the case of dissection, perforation, elastic recall or regidocinosis of greater than 30% despite prolonged balloon inflation, smart or complete SC nitinol self-expanding stents were used in the SFA and the life stent was deployed in the popliteal with an e-bend during deployment. 35% of cases were done using the contralateral up and over coronary approach with Van G3 catheter, Amplat super stiff 0.035 inch wire and 7F Balkan tip sheath. In recurrent cases, we use cool laser excimer to vaporize the organized thrombus prior to angioplasty and restenting. Concomitant bilateral subentimal angioplasty and skin grafting is a preferred option in chronic combined arterial and venous ulcers. Wire exceeding through the transmetatarsal amputation allows rapid exchange of balloons and accurate stent deployment. At five years, amputation-free survival was not different with regards to the number of patients surviving without the need for major amputation regardless of whether they had primary SIA 72.9% or whether they had BS as their primary procedure 71.2%. Over a five-year period, 82.8% .8 of patients who had primary SIA showed sustained clinical improvement of at least Rutherford categories and maintained an improvement in ABI of at least 0.15 without the need for target lesion revascularization. This was similar to the sustained clinical improvement rate seen with BS. At five years, freedom from binary restenosis, as assessed by duplex ultrasound, was statistically similar between SIA and standard BS. Five-year freedom from TLR for SIA, 85.9%, was improved, albeit non-significantly, when compared to BS, 72.1%, with a non-significant reduction in the mean number of procedures in the SIA group compared to the BS group. Cox proportional analysis showed that hyperhomocysteinemia was an adverse prognostic indicator for the risk of binary restenosis at five years for both SIA and BS. A Cox proportional hazard ratio was performed to determine the factors related to adverse prognosis for amputation-free survival. We found that hyperfibrinogenemia significantly increased the risk of death and or amputation at five years. Elevated CRP had an adverse prognostic effect. Elevated HPA1C was not prognostic. The use of a stent did not impact on the risk of binary restenosis at five years. Similarly, the mean number of stents we used was not prognostic indicators of the risk of restenosis. Perioperative mortality was more than halved with SIA compared to BS, despite a lack of statistical significance. The significant reduction in perioperative morbidity is reflected in the sizable reduction in hospital stay following SIA compared to BS, and by five years SIA patients continued to show sustained freedom from major adverse clinical events such as death, limb loss, myocardial infarction or stroke despite no significant difference in all-cause survival. 
Routine duplex follow-up and aggressive intervention were done only in symptomatic patients. Mean number of procedures were equivalent between the two groups as five-year risk of re-intervention. Over a six-year period, 2001 to 2007, we treated 128 critically ischemic limbs with BS at a total inpatient of cost of 2.185 million euro. We treated 78 extra patients with SIA and it cost 77,500 euro less if we include the cost of five years follow-up and repeat procedures. Mean cost per primary procedure is 11,600 euro for SIA and 18,700 euro for OR. This meant that there was a saving per primary procedure is 7,070 euro if treated with SIA rather than BS. SIA costs 5,662 euro per quali. This is 3,509 euro cheaper per quali than BS, giving an incremental cost effectiveness ratio of SIA versus BS of 10,768 euro per quali gained. Over a five-year follow-up period, the quality of time spent without symptoms of disease or toxicity of treatment was 24.7 months for SIA versus 24.5 months for BS. Sensitivity analysis showed that Q-twist was significantly improved with SIA compared to BS over a full range of utility values between 0 and 1. Since the introduction of SIA, our mortality dropped to 2.3% and our one-year amputation-free survival enhanced to 87%. BS is an independent risk factor for major adverse clinical events. Five years freedom from major adverse clinical events in SIA is enhanced by 20%. SIA augments patient-specific Q-twist with substantial cost reduction. SIA expands AFS for and symptom-free survival and it is minimally invasive and allows for high patient turnover without compromising limb salvage. Patient selection is therefore probably a good explanation for the wide variation in published results. As long as there is no randomized trial comparing SIA to surgery, we must be critical. However, with the available data currently at hand, this technique seems to be efficacious and sustainable. SIA has caused the paradigm shift and is now the gold standard in management of CLI.